Hi. So in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the decibel scale. In our previous lectures, we talked about how sounds differ in terms of um, frequency, wavelength, and depending upon the medium, they might change. Uh, they might travel with different velocities. Few of these dimensions are uh, our attributes are fixed. Uh, for example, we use seconds to calculate duration, and uh, um, cycles per second is what we call as hertz. However, some of those measures are relative. We talked about phase, how we need two or more waves uh, to, to see how they differ in terms of the phase. One such attribute um, that is relative is, um, is, how, is their amplitude. The amplitude of a simple sinusoidic sound uh, when it travels through air uh, is actually how far the particles in the medium are displaced uh, for any given cycle. So if we hit uh, the tuning fork um, with, a, with more power, it's going to displace those particles around the throngs of the tuning fork um, along a long, larger distance. So it's mainly depending upon the force that sets that vibrator into oscillation. So more the force, uh, more the particles in the, uh, the medium are going to be displaced um, and uh, louder the sound is going to be. And typically when we plot the sound, uh, we use the height uh, of the waveform or the height, of the y-axis in the spectrum um, to represent amplitude. So as mentioned earlier, the amplitude is going to be uh, determined by how far the particles are being displaced within a given medium by this vibrating source. Now there's two different ways of quantifying amplitude. Uh, we can quantify amplitude in terms of uh, power. Uh, per unit area, or you can quantify that in terms of sound pressure. Okay, there's there are just two different ways of quantifying uh, the amplitude of any given sound. Just like we can use uh, miles and kilometer for distance, um, and there's a fixed relationship between these two measures, or we can use uh, kilograms and pounds to measure or quantify the mass of an object. When we use power per unit area, uh, we are measuring actually the intensity level. If you're quantifying sound as a pressure per unit area, uh, you're, you're, you're measuring the sound pressure level. And there's a certain relationship between these two sound pressure level and intensity level, and we're going to be talking about that in just a bit. In physical terms, uh, the intensity level, as I said, is the amount of power uh, that's within a certain unit area. And power, uh, we use a unit of watts to quantify power. And the unit area would be meter square, a squared meter. So hence, uh, intensity level, uh, we use a unit watts per meter square. However, sound amplitude can be also quantified in terms of sound pressure level. If you're quantifying sound pressure level, we use a unit of pascals. Um, and, and actually, Pascal's is used as a unit to measure pressure um, in other um, arenas also. For instance, uh, that atmospheric pressure is, um, is equivalent to uh, normal atmospheric pressure is about 100,000 Pascal's, uh, 100 kilopascals. When we're using pressure to quantify sound amplitude, um, again, we call it as a sound pressure level. While pressure basically is a measure of force applied on a surface, um, and it's directly dependent upon the force. Um, so you can increase the pressure by two ways. You can either um, increase the force, uh, or you can decrease or reduce the surface area. Either way, uh, you'll have a greater pressure. 
An analogy that I use is a thumbtack. Uh, and we're using a pointy end versus a flat end. So with the same pressure uh, force, uh, if you use a pointy end, which has a reduced surface area, you can get more pressure. Uh, and, uh, and thankfully, the the shot we get would be less painful than, let's say, using a blunt needle. Um, there's another way of uh, quantifying pressure that would be using newtons per meter square, but the popular one uh, that we use is pascals. And there's a certain relationship between pascals and uh, newtons per meter square. So let's talk about how power and pressure are related. Um, so, so any given sound source radiates power, uh, and that's going to result in pressure deflections in the environment around it, in the area around it. Consider this analogy of um, a surface uh, or a space heater. Okay. We know that, uh, particularly in this fall season, um, you might be out buying a space heater which comes in different power ratings. And, uh, the way they quantify power uh, is, let's say, 1,000 watts or 2,000 watts. And intuitively, we know that the more number of watts means that uh, more power and hence more heat this space heater can generate. However, the effective um, change that we desire is a change in the temperature that the space heater does to your room or um, in, your home, in your home. Um, but the temperature that a space heater creates uh, is going to depend on another variable. Uh, the room where you place that space heater. Okay. So for the same space heater um, might result in a, a larger temperature change depending upon whether you place it in a small room or in a large room. Um, such is a relationship between power and pressure in terms of sound amplitude. Um, consider the pressure to be like the temperature of a space heater um, and while the power is going to depend on uh, how much the power uh, of the space heater you buy. So the same, same amplifier of, of a certain power might seem loud in a closet, uh, while that amplifier, if you place it in a large room, might not result in, uh, in a large pressure change or um, may not sound loud to you. So the power refers to the capacity of the device to produce uh, amplitude, but the essential effect of that device is going to depend on the room uh, where you place it, um, and that would be the pressure. So what we hear is actually the pressure uh, fluctuations in the air that reaches our uh, auditory system. However, it's caused by the sound power um, from the source uh, that results in producing that sound. Um, as an audiologist or as an acoustical engineer, we prefer to quantify the human response to sound. Um, for example, like when we're quantifying the, like the industrial noise and how much noise annoyance um, some, some equipment is making. Um, so hence we prefer using sound pressure as a way of quantifying amplitude. Manufacturers, equipment manufacturers on the other hand, uh, might find it simple to uh, quantify the, uh, the sound amplitude in terms of power. So that's why when you go out to buy a surround system or a sound amplifier, uh, often they might rate that at, let's say, 100 watts or 500 watts. Um, car stereo or on 500 watts surround system. But however, the, the effect that the that this surround system is going to make in, in terms of pressure and um, sound amplitude is going to depend upon where you place that surround system. So a, a, a 500 watts surround system might sound loud in your in your living room, but if you were to keep that in an amphitheater, um, that 500 watts will not probably result in a loud sound for a large audience. 
So as I said, there is a, a definite relationship between um, sound pressure level and intensity level, such that the intensity level is uh, sound pressure level squared. So it's proportional to each other. So initially we talked about how sound amplitude is a relative measure. And let me try to explain uh, how it is. So unlike uh, other units that we are familiar with, like the meter and the kilogram, or at the second for time, um, amp sound amplitude is um, is an arbitrary scale. And why it's arbitrary is based is because it's based on what we consider is average sensitivity of a normal hearing listener. In other words, when we are adopting uh, a scale, uh, and the scale that we use to quantify sound amplitude now is the decibel scale or dB scale, the dB scale is based upon uh, what sound amplitude makes sense to us uh, uh, as a human listener. And Two lectures back, we talked about how the human auditory system is limited, has operating limits uh, in terms of frequency. Namely, we can hear sounds only when it falls between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. And it's also limited by the amplitude of the sound. Um, in other words, there are some sounds that are so soft that we can't hear. And, and also there are sounds, let's say a, a large explosion or interstellar uh, explosion, for example, uh, that's too loud that we wouldn't hear that as a sound. Uh, you might feel that as a painful experience, but not as a sound um, experience. So we needed to come up with a scale that is, uh, was convenient for us and uh, is functional. Um, so the decibel scale is functional because it's based upon uh, the range of amplitudes that, um, that the human auditory system can perceive as sound. So naturally, for audiological convenience, the standard uh, reference amplitude that we use um, is based on the just detectable level of a typical normal hearing listener. Um, so initially, when they would try to do, come up with a scale, they actually tested um, a large group of what we call as autological normal hearing individuals, those who don't have a, a significant hearing loss or any other ear pathology, and they tried to find out how much pressure and how much power per unit area they needed to barely hear different frequencies. And based on that measure, uh, they came up with this decibel scale. And for convenience, uh, this reference value uh, would be zero decibels. Um, so the lowest sound pressure or the lowest um, watts per meter square uh, or power per unit area that we can hear uh, is what we call a zero decibels. Of course, a key point over here is uh, it's based on the average of a large number of normal hearing individuals because there are going to be individuals who can hear sounds even lesser than zero decibels and if you were to look at an audiogram you actually might see that there is um, some you can go as low as minus 10 decibels at some frequencies uh, and what we consider normal is uh, a, a range above zero decibels up to like 15 decibels um, and that still falls, falls within what we consider as normal. Okay. So again, the reference amplitude uh, can be either in intensity or pressure units. Okay. In terms of pressure units, um, what we consider as 0 dB SPL is 20 micropascals. And this refers to micro. That's a unit for micro. Um, Naturally, you can, you can imagine that uh, you're talking about very small uh, values of pressure and small values of power uh, that, that correspond to a sound.
So approximately it's equal to 2 to the 10 to the power of minus 10 of atmospheric pressure. That's the reason why we don't feel sound and we need a, a sensitive apparatus like our human auditory system um, to, to hear sound. And uh, it's estimated that um, a sound that's at threshold, it's, it's roughly equal to the sound of a mosquito uh, flying up almost three meters away from us. In terms of force per unit area, uh, the lowest amount of watts per meter square that we call as zero decibels is 10 to the power of minus 12 watts per meter square. And if you're using watts per meter square to quantify sound amplitude, uh, we would use the measure of 0 dB IL. So as I said, these values are astronomically small. And um, apparently it's estimated that a sound that is made at, at a threshold level um, just moves our tympanic membrane the width of uh, a hydrogen atom. And hypothetically, it's also estimated that um, it's so small that uh, even if you were to yell um, for eight years, seven months, and six days, the amount of um, energy that you can uh, you're producing would be just enough to heat one cup of coffee. So we're talking about very small values uh, that result in an, uh, an in a just audible sensation uh, for an average normal hearing listener. Okay, now you may ask why do we have to adapt a scale as complex or seemingly complex like the decibel. So although the the lowest sound that an average normal hearing listener can listen to is uh, very small, again 20 micropascals uh, in terms of pressure units and micro refers to one millionth of a, uh, a pascal, are 10 to the power of minus 12 watts per meter square in terms of power values. So that's the lowest level you can hear. But in the same scale, uh, the loudest sound that we can tolerate is quite wide. So the greatest sound pressure that we can tolerate um, before it becomes an, a painful experience is about 10 million times that of the just detectable sound pressure. Okay, so in terms of pressure values, you're talking about a range from 20 micropascals all the way up to 100 pascals. Okay, so that gives us a range of 10 to the power of 7, or 1 followed by 7 zeros. Uh, in terms of intensity level, uh, the range is actually twofold. Uh, so 10 to the power of 14 times um, would be the range between 10 to the power of minus 12 watts per meter square all the way to 100 watts per meter square, which would be the loudest sound we can tolerate. So we're talking about a real wide range of sounds that the human auditory system can perceive. Here, the smallest of these two amplitudes, uh, be it 20 micropascals, are 10 to the power of minus 12 watts per meter square is the lowest sound amplitude that an average normal hearing listener can detect. While the higher value is what we call as a threshold of discomfort. Uh, we can either use the term of LDL, stands for loudness discomfort level, or UCL, which stands for uncomfortable loudness level. And this is the level in which uh, a normal hearing listener um, can tolerate uh, um, the highest amplitude and beyond which sounds become intolerably loud and uh, and if they were exposed for a prolonged duration it's going to result in uh, an ear pathology because it's breaking down the system. And this large difference between 0 dB which would be the threshold level all the way to this loudness on discomfort level um, is what we call as a human dynamic range. And it refers to a range of pressure or power values that the human auditory system perceives as sound. Okay. So in this table, we're looking at um, micropascals um, and um, 
uh, the equivalent decibels for a range of sounds that we might encounter uh, around us. Um, so in terms of micropascals, you can see that we're moving all the way from 20 micropascals, uh, the lowest level that we can we can hear, all the way to 20 million micropascals. The, that would be like the sound of a jet engine um, in proximity. Um, and this is the whole wide range that we call as a dynamic range. And sounds that fall within this range uh, can be heard. Uh, naturally, you can see that if you were to use a scale uh, with this being the minimum, the 20 micropascals, and the 20 million micropascals as the maximum, uh, that would be one long scale. And that's one of the reasons why we had to adapt the decibel scale which is based on a log function to reduce this range to into a more manageable set of values. So there is a very, very large difference between uh, the lowest and the loudest sound that the human auditory system can perceive. And when we're dealing with such large ranges, um, we mathematicians and, uh, tend to adopt a, a log scale. When we're using a log scale, uh, it lets us compare two values of large magnitudes and makes it uh, into a more manageable range of numbers. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between a linear scale and a log scale. Okay, Linear scales are all around us, uh, like the scales that we use for, uh, for kilograms, uh, so for weight, like just kilograms or uh, distance. Um, we use meters, those are linear scales. Okay. On a linear scale, a change between two values is perceived as an absolute difference between those values. For example, a change from 1 to 2 is the same as a change between 7 and 8 or 19 and 20. Okay. On a log scale, on the other hand, a change between two values is perceived as a ratio of those two values. So in this case, uh, a change from 1 to 2, which would be a ratio of 1 times 2, uh, would be perceived as the same amount of increase or change as that from 4 to 8 or from 10 to 20. Okay. So here, if you're using a linear scale, um, the difference between 0 and 1 uh, would be the same as the difference between 3 and 4. And which would be the same as from 5 to 6. But in the bottom, you're seeing a log scale uh, where the change from 1 to 10 would be the same as 100 to 1,000 or 1,000 to 10,000. And it would be the same as the difference between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1. Okay. But what it does is when you convert a linear scale into a log scale is kind of squishes or compresses the whole wide range into a more manageable range. Okay, so thus here in the log scale um, in the table you're seeing at the bottom, you can show values between 0 0.001 all the way till 10,000, which would be a range of 10 to the power of 8. Uh, right there. So you can show that in a simple table, uh, a range of one followed by eight zeros into a more manageable uh, table. There are two other reasons why we have used, uh, we're using the log scale. Uh, for one thing, when you're using a log scale, uh, the change, uh, the positive change in intensity, like if you were to add two amplifiers together, uh, you can treat that as an addition or a subtraction um, instead of using multiplication or division. Um, so that's why when you add up two amplifiers of 100 watts and, and 100 watts, you can get a sound amplitude that's 200 watts. Uh, another main reason for adopting a log scale is um, it's been found that the human auditory system processes both intensity, uh, for that matter even frequency, on a log uh, on a log scale, uh, so it makes sense to use a scale uh, 
uh, that's log based because that's how the human artery system processes. So the human artery system does not process absolute differences between um, sounds, but the ratio of differences between sounds. And that's something that we're going to be touching on uh, when we review the anatomy physiology of the artery system. So here you can see again uh, the difference between the linear scale and the log scale. The monetary system that we use uh, over here and in many other countries is actually based on a log scale um, such that the different coins and notes that we use in the monetary system um, actually have almost equal distance um, between adjacent values. And we also have other log scales around us like the Richter scale that that quantifies the magnitude of uh, let's say an earthquake. Uh, that's also based on a, uh, it's a log scale. In clinical audiology, um, we of course use the decibel scale, that's a log scale. But also, when we're plotting the frequency um, on an audiogram, we also plot that based on a log scale. So as you can see, the, the frequencies we have over here is, uh, let's say, 125, 250 hertz, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, 2000 hertz, 4000 and 8000 hertz. Uh, and you can see that the relationship is such that the ratio is the same. And in this case, we call the ratio as an octave step, uh, where there's a doubling of frequency for each, uh, uh, for each step. And the reason why we do that is, again, um, in this case, in pure tone audiometry, we test these frequencies to kind of get a sample of uh, the hearing along the length of the basilar membrane, which is in your inner ear. Um, and we, since the basilar membrane, the frequencies are represented logarithmically uh, or based on a log scale, uh, we are almost testing like equal uh, distances along the length of the basilar membrane. Again, this goes back to the point that um, the auditory system processes sound in a log fashion. Um, another reason why we have adopted a log scale such as the decibel to quantify uh, the hearing within the auditory system. 